so much I want to say today, but let's go to the Word. Um, we've been going through a series in the book of Matthew. We've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount. And so I want to en encourage you again, if you have not been, I want to encourage you to start uh, reading the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. But the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' words. It's his, it's his instructions. It's his, it's his life. It's what, what kingdom living is supposed to look like. If you ever wondered, hey, what is it supposed to look like that I would live like Jesus and look like Jesus? Matthew chapter 5, it's, it's, where, it's where it's at. 5, 6, and 7. And so I want to encourage you uh, to keep on reading the Word of God. It's, it's our bread, it's our life, it's, it's Jesus. And so whenever you read the Word of God, if you've ever wondered who is God, what does He look like, read the Scripture, read the Bible, and it reveals who He is, what He's done, and is always good. Amen. All right, I want to encourage that. If you ever read the Scripture and you ever don't feel good, you got to reread it and say, all right, God, I want to receive it from you. And so read the Word. It's good for us. Matthew chapter 5 We've been walking through, and the last scriptures that we went through is Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 through 32, and we were talking about divorce. Jesus had something to say about divorce. Uh, if you have, if you weren't here for those messages, I encourage you, we do have a YouTube channel, go back and take a look. Hey, what does Jesus say about divorce? What is he speaking to us about? Um, but I want to encourage you this morning, divorce is not the end game of marriage. All right? If that's a word that you use on a regular basis as a threat in your marriages, uh, get rid of it. It's not the end game. It's not what God has for you. There is, as like we spoke uh, two weeks ago, my wife and I sharing a story, Rachel and I sharing a story, there is hope in Jesus for your marriage. Amen. There is hope for Jesus in every relationship that you're in. There is hope for Jesus. We had a minister look across the table from us, and for many years we had tried to get seek counsel and figure out, hey, what was going on, and we heard a lot of different advice that I, I knew it didn't line up with Scripture. And then finally somebody looked across the table from me and said, I don't have all the answers, but I know that uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it, what, it is the power of God for our salvation for all those who believe. And it's because of that verse that Rachel and I begin to say, hey, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how we're going to get it through. It, it, there's a lot of things. We had a counselor come to us and say, hey, out of a... Uh, 33 areas you guys are supposed to relate. There's only one area that you guys relate. Every other area is off. There's a reason why you guys have troubles. We said, we don't know what it's going to look like, but we knew in that moment that in Jesus there was hope for salvation. What is salvation? Salvation is complete and total restoration. And we stood before you, and I'll stand before you uh, again saying, because of Jesus, man, our marriage now looks like heaven, more like heaven than it ever had before. So this morning as we continue, I want to talk about marriage this morning. Uh, what is the goal of marriage? I'm hoping to answer that uh, through this message this morning. As we started this series on, uh, on marriage, we, we spoke that God exists in relationship, right? He is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They, they exist in relationship and they submit one to another and it's a, a beautiful picture of what love is. And when he looked at man and he said that he was alone, it wasn't good for him. He, he needed a, a, another, a helper, a, a spouse, somebody that there can be love with one another. He creates in relationship. And his laws, they maintain relationships. You can't be ever a lone Christian. Uh, my, my, that's what my former pastor would say all the time. There's no such thing as a lone Christian. Christians exist in relationship with one another. God's in relationship. That's how he set up life to be. And so our relationships that he has created us to have, have the ability to reflect who God is and what he's done. So we want to talk about that in the marriage relationship, but this goes for every relationship that we have. 
whether we're a, a, a manager at a workplace, whether we're a parent and we have a relationship with our children, whether we're a friend and we, sorry, whether we're somebody in Madison, we have a friend or we have a neighbor, uh, these, this uh, thing, uh, every relationship that we have, it should or it does have the ability to reflect who God is and what He's done. Where do we find this? John chapter 13, 35. This is especially true for those who are believers. John chapter 13, verse 35 this morning, it says this. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What is the basis of, of, the, of the relationship of, of God himself? It is love. There's interdependent love on each other, submitting to one another, serving one another. And, and in every relationship that we have as believers, as representations of Christ here in Madison, Wisconsin this morning, uh, we have the ability to show who God is and what he's done, how, how we relate to one another. I mean, I love I, I really do love our, our times of prayer and our times of worship and evangelism and, and, and sharing Jesus with other people and, and, and declaring truth to, to you on Sunday morning and declaring truth and sitting down over coffee with my, my Chinese believers and sharing with them like, the truth of who Jesus is and, and having those times of evangelism and have a little diagram I draw with them and everything like that. But do you know one of the most basic demonstrations of the gospel? is how we treat one another. One of the easiest forms of declaring the good news of Jesus is how we relate to each other. And not only in this room, so we had a moment a few Wednesdays ago where we meet for missional communities in homes across Madison. And so we, we had a moment where we were discussing in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. And Peter gives instructions to the believers who are in a, or underneath a, a government, the Roman Empire, uh, that really hated the Christians. They wanted to, they wanted to annihilate them. And any, any excuse they had, they wanted to get rid of the Christians at the time. And, and Peter steps in, Peter, a leader of the church, steps in, and he gives instructions to the, to the believers. He said, while you're scattered among the empire, live honorably among them and submit to the emperor. And we had a really good discussion that night. Uh, I say good. It was a very opinionated discussion. We shared what we were really feeling about that. We were, we were discussing different things and different avenues and different situations. And what about this? And what about that? And, and at the very end, we have this really lovely lady that, that comes to our missional community. She walks down the street. And she really doesn't say a whole lot during the discussion. But every once in a while, she'll, she'll go ahead and drop and there's like this like wisdom bomb, you know, like mic drop moment at the end of the at the end of the thing. She has to she always has to go. She's on she's on a time schedule. She leaves and so she will say usually like one or two lines right at the end. And she goes and she just stands up, she goes, sorry guys, I gotta leave. Um, but as we're looking at all this stuff, she said, uh, it's easy to love somebody who is lovable, but it's hard to love those who are unlovable. And it kind of just ended the whole conversation. <laughs> and then we all said, okay, Jesus, we need you to still work on our hearts. The same thing goes for us. We look across the room, and I hope that you would find people across the room that are, that are easy to love, right? It, 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 might be, it might be easy to love somebody sitting next to you this morning, somebody across the room, but, but we have the opportunity through our relationships, to declare the good news of who Jesus was. That he loved even when we were unlovable to him. And so in every relationship that we have, we have the opportunity. The opportunity is to love one another. And the way that we love, John 13, 35, the way that we love, even in those unlovable situations, it declares to others that we belong to Christ. <laughs> Have you ever had that happen? You live, you live in such a way with other people around you and they wonder, why, how can you put up with that person? How, how can you be in that tough situation and, and there's still something that's, that's like peaceful about you. 
It's an opportunity that we have to declare who He is and what He's done in our lives and what He's done in our hearts, our relationships, especially marriage, has the opportunity to declare the good news of who Jesus is with others. The mark of one submitted to Jesus as Lord is loving relationships. The picture of the church, we should be, we should be the best at relationships. Oh, I know, I'm convicting Andrew. Oh, I know. I, I'm working with this too. I, 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 tell, I confess to you guys all the time that the struggles I have with, with people, the annoyances I, I, I sometimes get a little bit uh, too under my skin. We should be the best at relationships. Why? Because we have the best example of love. This is what Paul brings our attention to, and that's where we're going to focus in Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul begins to, to talk about all sorts of different relationships. Like, like I mentioned, uh, we should be the best at relationships. And, and, and we're focusing on marriage here because I know Jesus began to expound on marriage in, in Matthew chapter 5. And he spoke some things about divorce. So we're going to focus on the marriage portion, but in every relationship. And if we look at Ephesians chapter 5, we see not only does it cover marriage, we do if you've got headings on your, in your scripture, you can see it talks about marriage here in a few uh, verses. It talks about children and parents. Uh, I'm going to read that one in Denver. You can obey your parents and the Lord. This is right. Honor your parents. Sorry. Uh, but, uh, you know, in every relationship, it talks about bond servants and masters. It, it talks about every relationship that we have should be dictated by this example that we see in Christ. And so let's look here first, Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to go in verse 1 uh, to start with. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. How many of you are brother? You're, you're, you're a child of God. Christ is coming in you. You have been walking in faith, and you are now a child of God. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Therefore, what, are, what is the therefore? The therefore is because you have been put to faith in, you have put your faith in Jesus and died to your old way of living. Every time you see a, a therefore in scripture, I encourage you, and, and, and Miss Linda, if she was here, she always tells people, hey, look back a few verses and figure out what's the there, therefore is therefore. I'm twister. I got, I'm glad I got that one out this morning. Took some nightfall last night. I'm kind of a little bit fuzzy. But, um, the why is it therefore? Therefore, be imitators of God. Why is it? Why is it therefore? Because he's, he's talked just previously about those who have put their faith in Jesus are going to put off their old way of living and now live by the Spirit. So, because you have put your faith in Jesus, you have put away your old way of living. You're now walking in the Spirit. Therefore, be imitators of God. You put your faith in in, in, in Jesus. You you declared that. He is your Lord, that He is the way, that His way of living is the right choice all the time. So be imitators of Him. So watch how He lives and, and try to reflect the way that He shows life should be. Verse 5, and it brings us up again. And I'll, I'll repeat this kind of phrases over and over and over again because there is nothing more... There's nothing more to Christian living than this. There's nothing more to the gospel than this. Jesus, while we were still sinners, gave himself up for us. Keep on encouraging us, love. Keep on encouraging us. How do you how do you stay motivated to live for Jesus? How do you stay motivated to do the right thing? How do I how do you how do you live this out? How do you walk it out? You walk it out by truly believing Romans chapter one verse sixteen that we shared a few weeks ago. We we do this by believing that it is true that God gave up everything. Jesus had everything, and He gave it all up for me and for you. 
And for each one of us in this room, and for each neighbor across the uh, across the Madison, uh, each neighbor across the state, every single person, he he had everything and he gave it up completely. He emptied himself for us. So when I'm struggling with my son, I'm trying to I'm trying to convince him what what ways to go in his will and my will, and I have to remember, oh, Jesus gave up everything for him, and when I really have something else to do, and, and he wants me to do this, and I realize, no, God gave it all up for me, and I'm willing to live this love for him. When I'm in my relationship with my spouse, the same way that Christ gave up everything, he emptied himself, he was God sitting on the throne, deserving of all worship, he didn't consider it quality, something to be used for his own advantage, but he said, no, I, I want to submit myself all the way to the point of death for you. This is the picture of the love that was given for me, and now because it has been done for me, the opportunity then is to reciprocate that to others. The imitators of God walk in love as Christ Love. How did he love? He put others' greatest good at his greatest expense. What does love look like? Others' greatest good at my greatest expense. Everybody in the room said, help me, Lord. <laughs> help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Because I mean, I still like myself. I still like my desire. I still like my ways. I still, I, I still want to live a little bit. I, I still want to be alive. I still, I'm still a person. I still have likes and desires. But others' greatest good, and Jesus put others' greatest good, he put your greatest good, he put my greatest good at his greatest expense. When we have this definition of love, let's look for a moment at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Everybody likes quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a really good chapter all about love. And at, at weddings, we like to quote this. But if we don't quite have the right definition of love, when we look at love repeated so many times, we really don't get the full picture here. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, it says, love is patient. This helps a whole lot when I understand this and I'm thinking about the relationships with my sons or with my neighbors upstairs. That <laughs> we got new neighbors. We're learning how to love our neighbors. Oh my goodness, this is, they got an elephant upstairs. I love it. What it is. Love is patient. Love is thinking about their greatest good at my expense at 2 a.m. when they're little kids. <laughs> Love is kind. Love is kind. Even when I have a, a right to do something about it, or I have the ability to do something about it, I'm going to choose kindness. Jesus Christ. We look at Jesus Christ, the, the perfect example of love, and, and he had the ability, he had the right, at the moment they were beating him, and whipping him, and spitting on him, tearing out his beard when he was close to death, he had the right and the ability to call down angels and rescue them. Out of kindness towards us. Continue to say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Love, it doesn't envy. It's all right if they got that better position. That's all right if they got that bigger income. That's all right if they got that really nice looking marriage. It's all right if they got that. Straight A student. It's our, it doesn't envy because it's their best. I'm okay with them having the best. I, I'm choosing love. It doesn't boast. It's not arrogant. 
It's not rude. Why? Because it, 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 it understands, hey, even if I'm in, in the position that I'm in, Jesus, in, in, his, in the throne, he has the, the highest place, he has all authority, he has everything that he could use for his own advantage, but he didn't consider it something to be used for his own advantage. He didn't, it was not worth it. What was worth it was coming and, and showing love, sacrificing it all. Not arrogant, it's not prideful, it's not rude. It doesn't insist on its own way, it is not irritable. Uh, I gotta work on that one. <laughs> it's not irritable. It's not resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, it believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love. <clears throat> Your greatest and my greatest expense. Son, your greatest, my greatest. Wife, your greatest, my greatest. Neighbor, your greatest, my greatest expense. Coworker, your greatest, my greatest expense. Somebody asked a question as we were going over some of these topics. What if they take advantage of me? I don't want to be trampled on. Their greatest. My greatest expense. Jesus was willing to go all the way to the point of death on your behalf. My and if we are to be imitators of God in this, if we are to follow and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, as a sacrifice to God, it may come at the cost of being trampled on. But we're going to follow the way of love. And I'm going to put you ahead of me. Just take a moment and strip all of who I am off, Lord. I, I've been praying that as I go through this, this message. Get rid of me. I like to be alive. As Paul transitions now into talking about marriage, he does so with this lens. You instead of me. Instead of me, right? So, sorry, oh, it's like that, like a heavy moment now. Pastor got all real about it, got all in to it. Let's just take a moment and pray. Okay, uh, I can see it already. Right. So, this is the main thing. Let's look, look for a moment. I know everybody bowed their head. That was a good, that was good, good practice. Good preaching. Okay. Everybody bowed their head about to pray. All right. The amazing thing about who God is, is he, he, he never lords himself or his position over us. He always offers it to us. This is the truth. This is the way. This is the truth. This is who I am. This is the truth. This is the way. This is who I am. Our decision to take up, that's why he says, hey, take up your cross. It's a choice. We've got to take up the we have to take up the decision. We have to choose to be imitators. We have a decision to make. We have a way to make so that we can go in his direction. So this is a principle of scripture that I, I, I say this all the time in this moment, especially because as I was reading and as I'm studying this word this week, I was like, man, condemnation is coming. Man, I remember this moment. I didn't put myself, I didn't put the other person above myself. I remember this moment. I didn't put my uh, my, my spouse above, above me. I remember this moment. I didn't, and this moment, and this moment, and this moment. And I'm definitely irritable about a lot of different things, right? 
And all of a sudden, they, they became, I started getting more condemned than I started to get convicted that there's a way to Jesus, okay? And so whenever those moments happen, whenever we feel the, the, the heaviness of the truth of God's scripture on us, I want to remind us, and, and, and as the church, this is a principle for every message that you hear me preach, that there is grace. God has grace for us. What does that mean, Andrew? You just said a little bit of conviction. Now we're off this, off, 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 off. No. There's grace. When we humble ourselves before God, he gives us grace. That's his strength. That's his character. Move on us. Right? So, so when things become heavy from the word of God, and, and he's like, hey, you're still living for yourself. You, you, you're still alive. You, your relationships are messed up. We say, okay, God. We bow before him. Okay? We humble ourselves before God. And when you humble yourselves before God, it says that his grace then lifts us up. The opposite of, of being humble is not being strong. Sometimes we have that in our minds. I, I, I'm strong, so I'm not going to humble myself. I'm not going to bow my knee. That's, that's a position of weakness. It's actually a position of strength to humble yourself. Because you recognize you can't do it on your own. And so we humble ourselves when we realize, man, my relationships are screwed up, and, and I'm at the center of the reason why they're messed up. Oh, God, help me. Help me. I need, I need a greater understanding, Christ, of your love. Help me to believe, Jesus, that it's, it's better to empty myself completely on behalf of somebody else than to be arrogant and, and, and prideful and, and, and do all of it. We humble ourselves before him. And it says that in due time, he will lift us up. How long do I have to stay humble? As long as it needs for God's grace or his character to be so impressed on my life that it changes how I live. To be prideful, it says, to do our own thing. He resists, he actually has nothing to do with us. So the key to being imitators of Christ, to walking in love, I'll admit, I still need help with this, is to continually walk in a position of humility before the Lord and say, God, I, I can't do this on my own. I need your help in this. I need your grace so that I can love others as you have loved me. I, I, I need your strength to help me in, the, in this moment because I'm still pretty irritable. God, I, I, give me your grace because, man, I, I'm thinking about myself and its relationship and, and how much I can get out of it more than what the other person needs are. If we are to walk in love, we are to think about the other's greatest, and our greatest expense, and that is exactly what Jesus has done for us. And this is the lens in which Paul says these words about marriage. And he says this, starting in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and himself is its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everyone, everything to their husbands. Husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as his own body. He loves his wife, loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. 
Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let his wife see that she respects her husband. With this lens that we think about the other's good at my greatest expense, we are imitators of Christ, then our marriages are an image of the good news of who Jesus is. This is why in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, all of a sudden Jesus declares, uh, seemingly out of nowhere, uh, uh, against what the tradition was at the time, that, that, uh, that there could be a certificate of divorce, and he declares, there is no basis for divorce, except when a covenant is broken. Jesus, I want to look at what a, what a beautiful marriage will be like. Jesus has been faithful to his bride, the church, for years. I just confessed already, and I know you guys are already feeling it. You know that you have been unfaithful to who Christ is. And Christ said, I've made a covenant with you. to you. My love, as we sing this morning, it endures forever towards you. And this is why if he's talking about that, the, that a marriage is a picture of Christ and the church, this is why divorce it really shouldn't be an option. There should be, it should be exhausted the attempts to repair and to restore because man, Jesus is going all out for us, faithful to us forever, enduring all of our unfaithfulness, all the way to the point where one day we'll be united with them. There'll be a huge celebration and a banquet table ahead of them. Why? Because a, a marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Faithful, love, forever. In view of Christ, out of respect for what Christ has done, submit to one another, verse 21. Put the other above myself. So wives, Empty yourself by submitting to your husband. Love as Christ loved. Didn't take this position and try to force us into these things. He emptied himself. Desires submitted. You are tied together with your husband. As I was searching and I was researching and <coughs> studying for this, I was looking at studies, and there are so many studies. They, would, they were taking this whole uh, passage of Scripture, verse 22 through 33, and they were highlighting verse 22 as the main scripture to memorize. I thought to myself, that makes no sense when I look at what Paul is speaking to us. As I continue reading through verse 25 through 33, all the husbands who glared at their wives and pointed to them when verse 22 and 24 was read. Husbands, you don't even understand the depth of which we are called to in our marriage. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. I'm going to read this over again. Let's read this. Let's hear this. 
Love your wives as Christ loved the church, giving himself up for her. That he might sanctify her and cleanse her and wash her so that he might present her with splendor, without spot or without wrinkle, that she might be holy without blemish in the same way husbands should love their wives as his own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. How do I know, or how am I convinced, how do I know that in a marriage relationship the husband is not supposed to lord himself and his way over his spouse, over his wife? Because when I look at the picture of Jesus, he used everything, uh, he took everything at his disposal and he set it apart and he did this for the church. He made the church his co-heir. That's a, that's a nice uh, old term, co-heir. Denver's really excited because he's like, hey, Dad, I'm the only heir in your family. <laughs> I, get, I get everything. He said that a few times as we were talking over the last couple of weeks. I get everything. An heir is one, right? Uh, especially in, in, in uh, Old Testament times, the heir is one, the firstborn son, they get, they get an inheritance, they get it all, they, 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 they get the best, right? What does Christ do for those who have put their faith in Him? We now are elevated. I have to be careful because some people tell me shut up when I say things. We're elevated to the same position that Christ has. We are co heirs with Christ. That's what he did with the church. He didn't say, okay, you got Jesus, we got, got the Father, we got Jesus, and then you got we got the church is kind of like the stepchild, and Jesus has the better. The church is like the second right, and the Jesus is like the first. No, he said, I, we're co heirs. <laughs> with Christ. So when I. So when I when I read through things and, I, and they're saying and they're saying hey you know the the, the wife submit to the husband and the husband is supposed to lord over and, 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 and have dominion over and all these all these harsh words that I know people already think about when they're reading this passage and I'm like I'm telling you, no God's instructions to the husband is say no you're supposed to empty yourself out completely. Lifting your spouse, up, your wife up. So that you guys are, are co-heirs, that you guys are equal. There's no male, there's no female, there's no slaves, there's no free. We're all three equal in Christ. Do not lord over the church. Husband loves your wife as their own bodies. Not as property, but as the best. He who loves his wife, he loves himself because in verse 31 it says that the two now are one. God didn't take the foot of Adam and, and create the woman. He said, no, I've taken the rib, and I've created a woman, and now you together. What is the key to marriage that looks like the gospel? It is not when one submits to the other in, in totalitary and, and out of dominion. No, it's when we are imitators of God and Walk in love together and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then when the scripture comes together, when we see, hey, the wife say hey, you're supposed to you're supposed to empty your desires and submit to the husband and, and the, the husband then also, just as Christ did, so, uh, empty himself and, and serve you and bring you to equality so that you can look like Jesus. 
And this, verse 32, is the mystery profound that I am saying, that it refers to Christ and the church. Just as Christ loved the church, making, building her up in, and making her co-heir with Christ, so in a marriage, love one another, be imitators of Christ, serving each other. And thus, the love of God is shown. Husbands love, wives respect. You are one. And relationships, every relationship, especially marriage, enables us to declare the good news of Jesus and his love. I'm going to go back to John chapter 13, verse 35 this morning. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If you are willing to put the other's greatest good at your greatest expense. How many this morning would say, I still need help with that. I'm, on, I'm raising money. I still need help with that. I need some grace. I need... God, I need you to work on my heart. And so this morning, before we go, we have an opportunity to do just that, to say, God, I need some help with that. God, I need some help. I still, I still want to go my way and do my thing and, and make my desires higher than the other. I still think more about myself than the other person. And, and God says, the example of, of love, in your relationship, every relationship, the love that you have, it, it, the example is love each other within our relationships, especially marriage. It declares the good news of who God is. I'm going to pray over you, and then let's take a moment to respond. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. And though it came to us and was heavy on our hearts when we began to realize how much we don't look like you in our relationships, uh, Father, I thank you this morning that, that Jesus, your, your grace is forever for us. And and there is a truth to your word that if we humble ourselves before you, God, we can receive grace from you. We can receive strength from your character so that we live like you. And God, I pray that now for each one in this room, recognizing, God, that they still need help with that. They still need help putting the other above themselves, submitting to the other above themselves. Uh, God, I pray that they would receive grace today to live this out. To walk in love so that all those around us may know that you are good, that you are for us, and that your love never ends. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.